This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Danny Berger and Priti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today, stocks gain and the dollar drops as markets await the latest read on U.S. inflation. Expectations show CPI to have moderated further in June, weakening the case for more rate hikes. A federal court rules in favor of Microsoft's $69 billion takeover of Activision in a big loss to the FTC's big tech scrutiny. Focus shifts to the UK CMA just as the FTC may lean towards appealing the ruling. It's day two of the NATO summit. It's underway in Vilnius with the path for Ukraine to join the alliance still unclear. President Biden and Zelensky are set to meet later today. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. It's the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Kriti, happy CPI day to you. The market seems set up maybe to prepare for a cooler report today. It absolutely is, especially when you look at those bond and currency markets, which makes today tr today's trade fairly simple in the pre-market, at least until we get that data at about 8.30 a.m. local time. Take a look at what futures are doing right now, though. Uh, we are, of course, seeing, well, uh, stock 600 futures seem to be in the green, Danny. But I got to say, uh, U.S. futures, uh, perhaps telling a little bit of a story. There is an element of caution there. But to me, again, the bond market is where it really matters. The 10-year yield, 394 is what we're looking at, down about two basis points already. Now, I bring up the 10-year yield here. Traditionally, I like to look at the front end of the curve, but that 4% level is really interesting to me because you really saw a big retreat from that round number only to kind of make its way back up. And what's interesting is as yields move down across the curve, the dollar is following that cue. Look around the world, though. A lot of the dollar's action has been a function of what you're seeing in the euro, uh, the pound, or perhaps some of the other commodity exposed currencies around the world in G10 economies. Well, this time, you are seeing broad weakness in the dollar, which really tells you this is a U.S. bond market story. I want to bring it back to the currency story, though, because overnight in Asia, uh, the New Zealand Reserve Bank really talked about holding their rates steady at about 5.5 percent. You did see a big boost in the Kiwi for a second, only to have that paired back. But it is interesting that that idea of pausing for a second is starting to take hold globally. And that is a big deal in terms of what kind of precedent Jay Powell and his Federal Reserve is setting. Speaking of currencies and the precedent, let's talk about the dollar yen story, because you are seeing, again, a pullback in the dollar against the yen. We're looking at 139.61 on that crossover. Now, look, no major data here to really drive that trade, but it is notable the levels we're trading at just shy of that 140 level, Danny. No major data, not a, even any talk from BOJ officials. Sometimes that jawbone and gets things going. It shows how willing FX investors are to bet that we're going to be winding the bands of YCC, abandoning it, doing something different, or maybe that is just the trade, the flavor of the month. Now, when it comes to European equities, the flavor is higher. We're doing pretty good on the European equity trading session, which you just showed us, Critty. UK stocks outperforming. Perhaps it's just because they're so undervalued. I was talking with Jim Mellon of Burn Bray uh, Management earlier in the morning, who said that he really likes UK stocks. Again, they are trading at such a bargain right now. I want to show you UK assets in general. It's been a really fascinating morning. We got the UK's financial stability report from the BOE. Um, stress test, banks passed it, and it was a really stressful situation. And not that far from where we are now in the UK that they tested interest rates, for example, above 6%. Now, they said that the financial ecosystem could handle it. Banks could handle it. That's why we're seeing, for example, UK-based banks like Lloyd's rally in today's session. We're also seeing, for example, Barclays doing better too but it also said that there were still some vulnerabilities when it came to things like non-banking financial institutions that is really key that's what happened in the pension crisis blow up in that trust era budget so we're kind of hanging tight when it comes to the rest of UK assets not totally clear what that financial stability report means for monetary policy sterling little change in yields really just following the US critty five-year yields the belly of the curve having the majority of the movement falling about eight basis points coming after yesterday's record five-year auction in terms of demand for the U.S. Again, it's a U.S. market gearing up for CPI, and to some extent, it's also a European market gearing up for that critty. Well, let's expand on that exact topic. Of course, that's going to be the major macro focus for specifically the bond market and the FX market globally, which makes it pivotal for policymakers in the months ahead. Bloomberg Economics is estimating that core inflation could be the slowest since 2021. In theory, that's a good thing. Uh, let's see if it is in practice. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel joins us. Valerie, talk, walk us through the trade that we could see play out today. 
It's expected to be get a, a, a quite a soft number today, and I think the smart consensus out there is even going for a softer number than what we see on the Bloomberg consensus screen. Uh, it, but it has been an uncomfortably gradual easing in inflation. We really need to start seeing a, a 0 0.2 month on month or a 0 0.1 month on month in order for the Fed to feel a bit more comfortable here. Now, I want to take a look at what's been going on in the VIX market. I think something is really interesting I wanted to point out. The one one day VIX going into this uh, is pricing the lowest one day vol over the entire cycle. And that's because economists have been rather accurate in predicting inflation in 2023, and it has continued to, to fall. So perhaps we could get some equity market jump on a soft print, but it's unlikely to be the kind of volatile days that we've had, uh, it, it, especially when you look at the, one of the biggest volatile days of last year were all around these CPI prints. And that's just because it's really unlikely to shift the Fed hiking narrative for July. Markets are really expecting another 25 basis point rate rise from the Fed uh, in just two weeks time. Uh, but we do hear from three Fed speakers after the number today. We hear from Kashkari, we hear from Bostic, and we hear from Mester. Now, if we get another cool non-housing core CPI print, it goes a long way from strengthening arguments like to some officials like Bostic that say the Fed can afford to be patient, let the long and variable lags take hold and let that push inflation lower itself. So keep an eye if we do get any shift in language from these Fed speakers after the CPI print this afternoon. What is the risk though? It comes in cooler. We get that language from Fed officials, but it just reaccelerates. We see a real acceleration of inflation come summer, come post summer. Yeah, that, that's a true risk there, especially because this this print we get today has a lot of disinflationary base effects that are being baked in. You know, we're going from 4% headline CPI to a likely 3.1% print today. That's a big drop in the year on year numbers. But these like easy base effects really start to roll off when we get into the summer months. So it is a very key concern for markets that we do see, you know, some sort of teeny uh, acceleration in inflation because we all know that going from 4% to 2% is really going to be the hard part. Uh, yeah. And if we look at how the U.S. Uh, economy is holding up, you know, uh, housing has been solid, uh, reaccelerating in some ways. The labor market uh, remains strong and wage inflation remains above 4%. So a lot of questions out there on just how easy the path will be to 4 percent to two percent. Yeah, certainly a lot of questions still to be asked uh, even after today's CPI. Valerie, thank you so much. That is Bloomberg's Valerie Titel. Now let's get over to Vilnius where Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said he plans to fight for more security guarantees from allies at the NATO summit. Zelensky briefed the press after he arrived to the final day of the summit. Our agenda we have, I think for today, three priority questions. The first one is uh, weapon packages, new weapon packages for supporting our army on the battlefield. And that is one. The second, uh, I think, the invitation to NATO. And uh, um, we want to be on the same page with everybody, with all, all the understanding. And for today, what we, what, we, what we hear and understand that we'll have this invitation when security measures will allow. Let's get over to Maria Tadeo, who's also in Vilnius. Maria, looking at this current agreement as it stands by the Allies, to what degree does it fulfill Ukraine's wishes? Uh, well, you see there, President Zelensky is not fully convinced because he's coming into this meeting. Remember, the NATO-Ukraine format that has been established now will start today. In fact, this is the first time they meet bilateral like this. The NATO, uh, obviously, as an alliance and Ukraine as a country. Now, he says this is about the weapons. It will be about the security guarantees. But also, when it comes to that future invitation to join, he still said, quote, we have to get on the same page. Obviously, that is a reference 
to that communique that was agreed yesterday. The language on it said, yes, there will be an invitation extended potentially to Ukraine, but only, quote, when allies agree and conditions are met. Now, that means there is a double conditionality that would apply almost to the country, and the Ukrainians were hoping for a more forceful, direct, almost immediate uh, invitation. They knew they would not get a formal one, but they had a lot of expectations in terms of the political uh, signal, as you can see from President Zelensky, not fully satisfied. Now, he is here in the premises you see behind me. There's a number of meetings that are going on. We know he had a bilateral meeting with the German Chancellor, and as we speak, he is meeting with the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. So we're going into the final days of this summit. Maria, what can we expect here? What developments are left? Look, we're still expecting the final press conference from the NATO Secretary General. Of course, he will say this has been a successful meeting because that communique uh, showed that Ukraine has a path, even though the country, of course, such as that, is not fully happy about the way that it was framed. Obviously, you had Sweden join uh, with that green light from President Erdogan. They were waiting, of course, for President Biden, but a lot of the focus will be on the G7 countries. We know that they are likely to promise Ukraine security guarantees. Remember, we go back to the language. The Ukrainians do not want assurances. They want guarantees. They believe that is more powerful. So again, we're waiting on the details of what potential guarantees could be offered to Ukraine on the medium to long term. Certainly something we're going to be keeping in mind. Bloomers Maria today on the ground for us covering the NATO summit all week. We go uh, from Lithuania to Saudi Arabia. The nation's public investment fund reported a loss on investment activities of about $11 billion last year compared to a profit of about $19 billion in 2021, all coming as global, global markets sank. Joining us now to break it all down, Bloomberg's Yusuf Gamal Eldin. Uh, Yusuf, walk us through this story. That's quite the turnaround. Yes, yeah, so it's a tough time to be a sovereign wealth fund anywhere in the world. And it was a year where the S&P 500 was down 20%. Tells a story that even with hiring some of the greatest minds in the investment world, it wasn't enough to offset that in any meaningful way. And it also comes off the back of a year of profitability. The Saudis now are heavily involved in U.S. equities. I mean, we're talking about 356 billion U.S. dollars in exposure in U.S. equities, including stakes in Lucid Group, Activision, and Uber. That's according to a regulatory filing. The total assets have swelled as well. We're talking about $778 billion. Uh, the Saudis have been on a global acquisition spree since 2022. And a highlight of that has been, of course, their involvement in sports. Uh, there is probably no sport pretty much that's been left untouched. Everything from Formula One of course, for the recent travails and the contentious involvement in global golf. Yusuf, it's almost like you knew where I was going to go next. Yesterday, we had lawmakers grill the PGA on, it, on that merger with Live Golf. As you say, over those antitrust concerns, accusations that the Saudi government is using sports as a way to divert attention from human rights abusers, I want us to take a listen to what Senator Richard Blumenthal had to say yesterday. Americans very simply deserve to know what this agreement means for the future of golf, as well as for the future of the Saudi Arabian government's investment in sports and other autocratic regimes that may choose to do the same. Yusuf, this isn't exactly a ringing endorsement of this tie-up. No, it's not. And there's quite a bit of skepticism around how this deal came to be. I mean, there's a trove of emails and WhatsApps and memos and internal chats that have been brought to light by the Senate investigation that is currently ongoing. PGA Tour officials have defended their partnership with the Saudi PIF, but the documents do detail how the upstart Live Golf promised to stop poaching top golfers and competing against PGA. The tour sponsored events in exchange for a say in the sports governance and a share in future media rights as well. Uh, they reveal a PGA effort and a side deal to oust the live chief executive, Greg Norman. I mean, there are a lot of strings that are being pulled into this. Both sides have hired considerable legal muscle to kind of navigate through the next few weeks and months. But uh, we'll see where we land in terms of a final agreement and or the ongoing investigation results from the Senate. 
Yusuf, thank you so much. That's Bloomberg's Yusuf Gamal Aldin. Now, coming up, we have an all-star lineup of guests for you. First, Microsoft shifts its focus back to the UK after green light on the Activision takeover from the courts in America. We're going to speak to former legal, legal director of the UK Competition and Markets Authority, Tom Smith. That conversation next. Plus, as the NATO summit kicks off its second day, we're going to be speaking to Heather Conley, president of the German Marshall Fund on the ground in Vilnius. Plus, we'll also be speaking with Callum Pickering, senior economist at Berenberg, to look ahead to the CPI numbers and that UK financial stability report we just got a few hours ago. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Microsoft's $69 billion acquisition of Activision looks to be back on track. That comes after the FTC was denied an injunction to delay the deal by July 18th. Marks a big loss for antitrust scrutiny stateside, doubled down on by Commissioner Lena Khan. Now, Bloomberg reporting says the FTC is leaning towards appealing the decision as soon as today in a pretty non-traditional move after being denied that injunction in federal court. But there's still one more hiccup, convincing the Competition and Markets Authority, a UK regulatory body that had blocked the deal all the way back in April on a lot of the same concerns that the FTC presented in its five-day testimony. Microsoft President Brad Smith issued a statement saying, quote, our focus now turns back to the UK. While we ultimately disagree with the CMA's concerns, we are considering how the transaction might be modified. He goes on to say Microsoft and Activision have agreed with the CMA that stay of the litigation in the UK would be in the public interest. Now, we're joined by a true expert and the former legal director of the CMA, as well as a partner at Jardine Partners, Tom Smith, joins the show. Tom, a pleasure to have you on. Let's start there. The potential modification of the deal. What options are on the table? What could that look like? Yeah, that's right. So we're currently in a, in a bit of a limbo stage where we have an interim order in place which forbids the closing of the deal but the CMA has agreed to talk. And that's all they've done at this, at this point, they've agreed to talk. Um, it would have looked pretty bad if they'd refused to talk to Microsoft. So they'll listen to the proposals. There's a limited wiggle room at this point. I mean, they've, they've made their final decision. Normally when a final decision has been made, that is of course final. Uh, but in this case, that seems to be not the case. Um, there's some wiggle room under the legislation, limited amount, um, pending the appeal. Once the appeal happens, of course, the, uh, if the appeal succeeds, it will be sent back to the CMA to be redecided. If the appeal fails, then the final decision will stand. Um, so we'll have to see how, how it plays out. Now, a lot of the concerns here that the CMA had kind of outlined, like I said, very similar to what you saw in the FTC. By comparison, the European Commission agreed with those same concerns, essentially exclusivity, not being able to be competitive enough. But the EU said that would essentially be kind of uh, hurting Microsoft in the process if they choose to go down that path. The CMA taking a very different approach. Can you walk us through the divergences here? Why is the scrutiny mm -hmm. harder from the UK? Yeah, so the UK and the EU agreed on what the problems were. Uh, they both agreed there's a problem in the forward-looking cloud gaming market. Um, you can, of course, disagree about whether that's true or not, but they, the, both the two authorities did agree. What they disagreed on is what to do about it. Um, the UK takes a very strict line on these types of remedies and, and refused. Um, the EU takes a slightly more permissive approach and, and allowed the remedy. So that's where we are at the moment. Um, yesterday's announcement that they were the CMAs were open to discussing things with, with uh, Microsoft again makes me think that maybe that's uh, that's going to move still, but uh, we don't know where it's going to go. Would a licensing deal, for example, check some of those mm. boxes? How does that work? Yeah, at least in theory, a licensing deal could work. It's just the CMA hates that kind of remedy. It doesn't like monitoring that kind of uh, licensing, you know, for the next ten years. And it always thinks that the companies can gain these things to their advantage. So it takes a really very hard line on it. It looks unlikely that a, a full-on licensing deal would be allowed because they've made their final decision that it, that it wouldn't be an effective remedy. Um, so more likely some kind of structural remedy, maybe a partial divestiture is going to be discussed. I mean, really, we don't know what Microsoft has uh, up its sleeve. What, what would you suggest if you were still at the CMA? What would you do in this scenario? Yeah, well, I mean, they've... They've decided that prohibition is the only remedy at this point. So they're, they're obviously, they obviously want to show willing uh, to discuss it. Um, 
It also, by the way, delays the, the uh, competition appeal tribunal hearing. The CMA, the CMA already tried to delay the hearing, and, were, and that was rejected by the judge. So yesterday's move actually achieves that by other means, but I don't right. want to be too cynical about it. Well, I mean, to, to get back to Critty's point of the regional difference, how awkward of a situation mm -hmm. does this put the CMA in? If you have Europe agreeing, mm. you have the, U the US, a now different decision from mm. a judge, mm. How awkward is this for the CMA? It is awkward. It, it's going to happen, though. I mean, they're not going to come to the same conclusion on every case. They look at hundreds of mergers a year. I mean, it's just that this is a big one that everyone's interested in, isn't it? Yeah. So, it's, so it is awkward. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty kind of epoch-defining case for the CMA. Um, up until now, of course, the CMA has been on the same side as the American authorities, which is a slightly more comfortable place. But now the CMA, uh, I mean, assuming the, uh, the FTC doesn't uh, win in the end, now the CMA might be standing alone in trying to block a US to US deal on a global basis um, from London. Yeah. Now, Tom, this is a, an interesting pattern that we're seeing develop out of the UK specifically. There's been some speculation that whereas the US authorities haven't really been able to crack down on big tech the way perhaps Commissioner Lena Khan and some of her peers want to, mm. the European authorities are doing some of the heavy lifting. In your experience, how much kind of coordination, communication is there between the likes of the CMA and, say, the FTC or, or others in the US? Yeah, there's a lot of coordination, um, and, and there should be, really, and that's, that would make for a more efficient global system of merger control. Um, I mean, it, it varies from case to case. Uh, certainly, the, the CMA basically has a better process if you want to block mergers. The FTC has to go and, uh, go and persuade a judge. Um, some of these judges uh, are, are not going to be uh, of the same uh, mindset as, as someone like Lena Khan. Uh, whereas in the UK, the CMA can decide what to do and then just put it in place itself, subject only to a fairly limited, narrow uh, judicial review, it's called appeal process. Um, so it's undoubtedly, when, when both authorities want to block a merger, the CMA is more likely to be successful in doing so. But adding on to kind of the list of deals here in terms of efficiency that you just laid out, I mean, the CMA is also blocking the $20 billion deal between Adobe and Figma. We know there's scrutiny around Amazon as well. If the broader mm. concern here is simply disincentivizing innovation, doesn't chilling some of the deal making by big tech do just that? Yeah, a, a lot of people argue that, um, that intervening in these mergers uh, is bad for investment, bad for economic growth. I mean, the CMA would make the opposite argument, of course, that monopolies don't drive growth and innovation. Open markets drive growth and innovation. So that's what they'll be going around saying. And, and they're right about that, aren't they? I mean, all the economic literature shows that monopolies don't innovate in the end. They, they get stale. Um, and... Uh, if there are too many uh, markets in the UK or worldwide where there's only a couple of players, that, that doesn't look good for the future. Can I play devil's advocate with you? Mm. The, one of the issues that the UK faces that Jeremy Hunt has been talking about and trying to get pensions to invest in growth companies, for example, is not just innovation, but for big companies to exist and stay in the UK mm. for that type of growth. Again, not innovation, but say we have a big tech company like Arm to make sure it stays here you know, it doesn't go seeking SoftBank for, for financing. It doesn't go list in the U.S. Yeah, that's right. And, the, and actually, in this merger, the Microsoft merger, they had a really good, strong story about pro-competitive uh, effects of the merger and the, and, the, and the way it'll enable them to innovate and invest for the, for the future cloud gaming market. And, and, I mean, a lot of people, including me, believe those uh, arguments. So, so this case in particular is, a, is quite a strong case, actually, for, for, your, uh, for your argument there. Um, yeah, I mean, more, more generally, I mean, most, most cases that go to the phase two in-depth investigation process in London and Brussels don't have those kinds of strong arguments about investment and growth. Normally, it's a, it's a market which is already concentrated and two of the, two of the leading mm. competitors are buying each other. All right, Tom, I'm putting you on the spot here. 20 seconds. What do you think happens with this Microsoft Activision case? How does this play out at the end of the day? <laughs> well, we're in we're in uncharted territory already. I'm going to be pretty reluctant to make uh, to make predictions live on air. But um, yeah, I mean, most likely we go to the appeal, um, mm -hmm. and the, the normal process plays out. Uh, there is wiggle room on exactly what is being divested or or, yeah. or, or not not acquired in the first place. Um, so we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. Tom, wise man, <laughs> not making too not not going right into the details. I like it, Tom Smith. Detailed everywhere else, Tom Smith of Jardine Partners, thank you so much. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Stocks gaining and the dollar dropping as markets await the latest read on U.S. inflation. Expectations show CPI might have moderated further in June, weakening the case for further rate hikes. A federal court rules in favor of Microsoft's $69 billion takeover of Activision in a big loss to the FTC's big tech scrutiny. The focus now shifts to the U.K. CMA just as the FTC may be leaning towards appealing the ruling. And day two of the NATO summit underway in Vilnius with the, math, with the path for Ukraine to join the alliance still unclear. President Biden and Zelensky are set to meet later today. I'm Krita Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Danny, a lot to digest on the geopolitical front. We've got some micro stories as well in there. But I got to say the CPI report still very much in focus. It is, and it seems to be a market that is gearing up for a softer report. We've seen yields come in in this bond market. We've seen equities be able to rally. Um, perhaps you want to bet for 3.1% year over year for June, but what happens after? That's still where all the question marks lay. Now, that rally, most of that bond market action in the U.S. is really what's influencing the European trade. European equities up about eight-tenths of one percent. U.K. bond yields, those come in about eight basis points in the belly of the curve. And I'm flagging this specifically just because of all of the U.K. news, the research, the reports from the BOE, and even the talk from Andrew Bailey we've gotten today. They ran their stress test, the economy, the banks of the U.K., and most of corporate Britain can handle higher rates should they go beyond 6%. That's why in the UK trade we're seeing Lloyd's other UK-based banks rally nearly 3%. Sterling, though, really struggling to find any type of direction because while that might be true, there's also this concern that things like the LDI crisis, that those parts of financial stability haven't yet been solved. So it's a bit of a confusing picture so far this morning, Critty, when it comes to the UK, but still plenty of concerns abound. And I'm sure that trade will shift as well as soon as we get that inflationary data as well, because that's really what's all on the market's mind stateside here. You are looking at futures kind of mildly in the green following the European lead, Danny, I'd say, but higher by only two tenths of one percent. So no major conviction there. Forty four eighty two is where we are on those contracts for our radio audience. Now, look, the bond market gets interesting here because the 10 year yield pulling back from that four percent level. We're looking at three ninety three there down by three basis points. So it's interesting to see yield actually coming down uh, in anticipation of that CPI report, something that I think is pulling the dollar along with it, the dollar weaker against all the major currencies in the in the world. You're looking at the Kiwi as well, which, by the way, overnight talked about keeping their rates steady. What's interesting is they're kind of ripping a page out of the Powell playbook. So we'll see if some of that flows to some of the other G10 economies as well. And lastly, we always have to check on the BOJ dollar yen. Absent news, absent any kind of BOJ governor speak. 139.68 on that currency pair. So some technicals kicking in, Danny. All right, Kriti, let's talk about the second day of the NATO summit because it's underway as the Group of Seven Nations are set to announce the launch of individual negotiations with Ukraine to boost Kyiv's defense capabilities. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern spoke with the Ukrainian foreign minister yesterday. Well, these decisions, they make our path uh, to NATO shorter and they could have done it faster too if there was a clear indication when the invitation to Ukraine would be extended. Uh, we proceeded from the assumption that uh, all conditions are already in place for the inv invitation to be extended here in Vilnius, while the membership itself would take place uh, uh, when conditions allow. That was Ukrainian Foreign Minister speaking with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern yesterday. Joining us now is Heather Conley, president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, who has been at the NATO summit, is still there. Heather, thank you so much for joining us from Lithuania there. So Kuleba said it there. The language is when allies agree and conditions are met, Ukraine can join NATO. Kuleba also went on to say that they shouldn't be keeping Ukraine in limbo. What do you make of that language, of the language coming out of NATO around Ukraine's membership? Well, we definitely knew that the allies were not coming to this summit in, in unity about Ukraine. There really was a full spectrum of opinion. You had uh, the three Baltic states, you had Poland and others, uh, even the French saying, look, uh, this is the way we get to stability to end the war in Ukraine more quickly. And then you had those allies, the United States and Germany, um, very reluctant uh, and, uh, you know, as it's been very clearly stated, 
that uh, President Biden believes that uh, issuing that formal invitation to Ukraine would introduce uh, a war uh, NATO uh, in Russia. So I, they're, they're hesitating on doing that. The, the question is, where do we go from here? We have a very important summit in Washington uh, next year in July, the 75th anniversary of the summit. So we have so much work to do within the alliance to get that that clarity and that certainty about the path forward for Ukraine. Well, despite the path forward for Ukraine, NATO will be expanding with Turkey now stepping out of the way in terms of blocking Sweden. Uh, Peskov of Russia, the Kremlin spokesman, has, has already said that Russia will take unspecified measures in response to Sweden's membership of NATO. Heather, what do you make of these threats? What could be the Russian response to an enlarged NATO? So it's, a, it's an excellent example, uh, to be honest with you, of Russian saber rattling. So uh, well before NATO ever extended an invitation to Sweden or Finland, uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov had threatened a Russian nuclear attack against Sweden and Finland. What happened when both of those countries were given formal uh, invitations? Nothing happened. Putin didn't even react to it. And so I think there is some similarity here. And I think this is what several allies uh, in the alliance have, have been suggesting to the Biden administration. Don't, uh, don't take counsel of your fears. And Russia is saber rattling. When, when Russia confronts strength, um, they they do step back. So it is an important you know note for for all when it comes to Ukraine. Um, look, uh, security guarantees. Sweden has had security guarantees from the United States, from the United Kingdom, Poland, other allies in this period of interregnum for them. Um, so there could be some parallels exactly with Ukraine. You can extend the invitation. The ratification process could take years. So uh, this is where we need to have some creative thinking. But the longer there's an uncertainty, what we saw yesterday, Russia uh, launched m new missile attacks against Ukraine. When they see weakness and hesitancy, they do lean in. When they see clarity, um, uh, their rhetoric is strong, but they do not act. This is something important to remember. Heather, talk to us about the role that Belarus plays here. We know, of course, that Lukashenko played a role in terms of what was going to happen next uh, with the Wagner chief. But also talk to us about what that means in terms of the border around Ukraine. Is there a possibility here of a war on two fronts? Well, I asked that very question uh, yesterday morning to both the Latvian prime minister and the Estonian prime minister. What does this mean? And again, here we are in Vilnius. We are 50 plus kilometers away from the Belarusian border. We really are on the flank here. You feel the urgency. I will tell you the Latvian prime minister noted that we're, they're watching with concern. If you'll recall, a year and a half ago, Belarus weaponized migrants to, to force some instability in both Poland and Lithuania. So they do realize that with, with potentially Wagner's presence in Belarus, and of course, we're completely confused whether Vladimir Putin has disbanded Wagner, uh, Progozin is allowed to continue. We don't know what this means, but it, it has increased vigilance. Uh, Poland and Lithuania have put their, you know, much more troops, more vigilance nationally. We have to be concerned about hybridity. But the message from uh, the leaders here was they're watching. They don't believe there'll be instability necessarily because of the Wagner Belarus issue. The most important thing I think coming out of the NATO communique uh, was the approval of regional defense plans for the Baltics. So this will help strengthen resolve. It's also important that the language about NATO and, and its nuclear posture was reaffirmed. And this is in part a signal because Russia has now placed tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus closer to NATO territory. So again, heightened vigilance, clarity on uh, NATO is a nuclear alliance. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at this point, there's no immediate concern. Heather, 30 seconds here. I'm going to put you on the spot. We know, of course, President Biden and President Zelensky are meeting later today. There is going to be a little bit of awkwardness just given Ukraine's push to be a part of NATO, Biden's hesitance to say yes. What might that meeting yield? So I think the public part of the, the meeting, uh, President Zelensky does have to sell the security commitments that the G7 is announcing, 
uh, the important, you know, words of encouragement from NATO. He has to sell that as a victory. But this is just one more important step. Let's keep our focus on the Washington summit next year. Uh, let's make sure that uh, Ukraine takes important steps along the path to eventual NATO membership. Keep your eye on the prize. Take an important step. I hope that's the public message. I'm sure it's being well received. Heather Conley, president over at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, live for us from Vilnius. We thank you as always. And of course, we shouldn't keep in mind that Maria Tadeo will be speaking with the Latvia prime minister shortly, probably getting a little bit more color on that concept that uh, Heather was just speaking to us about. Now, coming up, we speak with Callum Pickering, senior economist at Berenberg Day, because after all, it is also CPI Day. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Eight of the UK's biggest banks all passed its latest stress test, with the BOE saying the firms can draw on 1.4 trillion pounds of liquid assets. Still, there are issues to be considered. The financial stability report released today reveals, quote, vulnerabilities in certain parts of market-based finance remain. These could crystallize in the context of current interest rate volatility amplifying any tightening in financial conditions, sounding a bit like the LDI blow up of the trust era budget. Joining us now to discuss this and more is Bloomberg's uh, Berenberg senior economist, Callum Pickering. We haven't hired you yet, Callum, yeah. as far as I know. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. Uh, I mean, look, it is an acknowledgement, and Bailey went on to say that too. Parts of the system are still vulnerable to higher rates. How much does this keep you up at night that we could have these corners, be it hedge funds, be it pensions, that could face stress should rates go higher? Um, honestly, not that much. It, it, the financial stability side of the bank has to always be a little bit circumspect. You can't say, well, everything's fine, we can keep raising rates and just forget about what this means for the financial system. But we have um, a major increase in regulation, major increase in liquidity and capital across the whole system over the last decade. You have evidence that policymakers know how and when to step in when you see these pockets of stress. And so I, I worry almost not at all about uh, stabi financial stability risk in the case of the UK. The, the, the thing to highlight here is actually just how uh, secure the financial system is. And it's the reason why when we started raising interest rates a year ago, 18 months ago, people were asking in markets, okay, what's the first thing to break? Because they thought something will break, then inflation will come out of the system, and then we'll have to worry about a recession. It's exactly what has not happened. We've yeah. had the financial system more or less process these rates fine. Okay, the Fed stepped in to deal with some US stuff. Bank of England stepped in to deal with some UK stuff. But by and large, we're actually trying to figure out now what a normal interest rate cycle looks like through the real economy. That's a big positive outcome in all of this. And I'm not surprised, actually, that despite the risk, the market still wants to try and find some risk where where he can. Could I say then, all right, Andrew Bailey and co can take it beyond 6%. They could take it up to 7%. This is an economy that can handle that. Well, there's eventually tolerance levels across different parts of the economy. It's just to say that if, and I don't think we do, the Bank of England needs to take rates to 6.5% like the overnight index swap market suggests. Um, and there's a part of the economy or the financial system that just can't tolerate rates above 55 uh, I trust that the system is, is, is secure enough and the Bank of England can step in to deal with that corner of the market so that it can distribute the effects as, as, it, as desired for monetary policy mm. purposes. All right, Callum, let's go from the UK to the US. It is CPI day after all. Talk to us about the report that's due in, in just a few hours here. We're expecting about 3.1% year over year. Is that going to be enough to convince the markets that inflation is headed in the right direction? Well, the market will be prone to big moves either way if we get a surprise and of course it depends on the, on the direction the general trend seems to be down in the US um, our bet is that that continues but but again as an economist I just always try to remind people that these are estimates of data 
they're not what is actually happening in the real economy. And so you need to look at data over three or four months to get a good underlying picture. The second thing, just to keep in mind, is prices are the consequence of something that's happening in the underlying economy. The inflationary process is detected in prices, but it's actually happening somewhere else. And the thing to emphasize is across the board, we have huge disinflationary forces from monetary policy, from improvements in global supply, from a moderation in demand. Inflation expectations are coming down. And so it would be an absolute miracle against all of these fundamentals if we suffered consistent upside surprises. And so if things are a bit hotter than expected today, I honestly wouldn't move worry too much about it. So that's the CPI story, Callum. Talk to us about the wage story here, because I feel like one of the narratives we're hearing, especially in the United States, is that a lot of labor conversations are locking in these higher wages for, for years yep. as inflation is coming down. But I've heard some economists say maybe that doesn't matter as much to the Federal Reserve's goal. How do you factor in wage inflation? Yep. Well, there's a structural wage um, upside risk coming from aging populations. Uh, as dependency ratios rise around the world, es essentially we have fewer people as a percentage of uh, the population who produce supply to the economy, whereas everybody demands stuff. And so wage pressures will be prone to upside risks. Um, when it comes to the specific issue of this wage price spiral, usually wage price spirals are, a re uh, are driven by workers bargaining their wages high in anticipation of future inflation. And if we look at inflation expectations, take the five-year break-even in the US, for instance, look at consumer-based measures, they've come down a lot. And so everything that I see in the data suggests that your workers are using tight labor markets to try and compensate themselves for the fact that they had a real income shock last year, not in anticipation of future high inflation, which is to say that wages are still following inflation as long as inflation expectations remain well anchored, as inflation comes down, with a lag, wages should come down too. The risk here is that central banks over tighten because they miss the fundamentals. Just as in 2021, they missed the inflationary fundamentals, the risk is now that they're missing the disinflationary fundamentals. And central banks often make mistakes. This is basically why, consistently. Yeah. Tom, we only have about a minute left, but that, that idea there, it's not an uncommon fear. Just yep. taking what you've heard from a lot of, I mean, let's just focus on the Fed here because, again, we don't have much time. Are, are, are you concerned some of the language you've heard coming out, that they will take it too far, that they're trying to do a little bit of uh, damage control in terms of, of their credibility? Uh, it's really a question of whether or not there's an unnecessary slowdown or an unnecessarily large recession in the U.S. That's clearly the risk. Base case is because we're tolerating these interest rates better than expected, it's lackluster growth for longer with probably a technical recession in the second half of the year. Um, from the Fed, one hike, maybe two if we're unlucky. Uh, my preference would be for all Western central banks just to stop for six months and be patient. The, the final point to make is we've been saying for decades it takes two years for monetary policy to have an effect we started raising interest rates 18 months ago now yeah. we're growing impatient after 500 basis points of hikes you know the setup here is here is clearly downside risk if we go much further right. it's just a matter of time before we all realize this certainly something we're keeping our eye on callum pickering of barenberg walking us through what to expect on this cpi day coming up we take a closer look at that consumer and the price basket we're expecting to get the update on plus Amazon's Prime Day, day two, what it's telling us about the consumer that comes up next. This is Bloomberg. We are getting some breaking news here, this time in the biotech healthcare space. The EU fining Illumina by 432 million euros for closing their Grail deal without approval. Grail, essentially their blood sequencing tool that they were using to detect cancer, something that they had spun off and then rebought uh, as something that was also the source of a lot of tension with activist investor Carl Icahn. We know that the CEO of Illumina has recently stepped down, Francis D'Souza. So the question remains what actually happens with the Grail business. We'll keep you updated as we know. But for now, 432 million million euros fined by the EU. Not having much of a reaction in the share price, but certainly something we'll keep our eye on. Investors in the meantime awaiting the latest read on U.S. inflation set to be released in a couple of hours. Let's bring in Bloomberg Simone Foxman for more. Look, this is supposed to be a really good moderation in numbers, Simone. I think 3.1 percent is the year over year figure. That's a massive decline from the 4 percent we saw last month. Walk us through what we can expect here. 
Yeah, I, I think what Callum was saying just now a few minutes ago about how these are a reflection of what we've heard in the real economy, these are just data, is something we have to keep in mind. And what executives have been telling us consistently is uh, we are nearing the end of the price creases that consumers uh, can tolerate. Uh, we heard that from the likes of General Mills, who said maybe it could squeeze through a handful of more price increases, but they're largely over. We've heard that from CarMax, who said that used car uh, prices and the used car our industry in general is uh, obviously still in depression. And I think that's why we not just have to look at the, the CPI print today, but also the producer price uh, print, because actually producer prices were falling to some degree, at least on a month on month basis, and could be moving higher. Um, partly that's because uh, companies not spending as much on energy, not spending as yeah. much on shipping. Uh, and so we could see that piece turn around. Does the Fed believe PPI is a forward looking indicator? That remains to be seen. Simone, we also get a little bit of a hint of how the consumer is doing, not just with the CPI, but anything we might hear from Amazon Prime Day, which, of course, Amazon is just a juggernaut when it comes to consumer-facing goods. Um, are there any hints? What are we exactly looking at to see what the outcome might be and what it says about the consumer? I mean, we'll talk about places where we're seeing disinflationary pressure. Online prices have clearly been one of those. Online prices actually falling 2.6% in June on a year-on-year -year basis. That is a 36-month low, according to Adobe. Um, I think this somewhat reflects what we could hear about Prime Day after it ends uh, at midnight uh, Pacific time. You know, Bloomberg Intelligence did a massive survey, more than 1,000 people, and those people really really looking at spending on electronics, admittedly a little bit less uh, than they did last year. Electronics, computers, yeah. that's one of the big places where we've seen online prices decline, yet do they spend more on grocery because their budgets are tightening, the wallets are being pinched. We yeah. are going to try and parse that on the limited data we will get out of Amazon uh, hopefully later this week. Um, but you know the exact specifics, the impact for Amazon, that's probably not something we're going to hear until probably October. Yeah, certainly something we're keeping an eye on. Simone Foxman uh, walking us through the story there. Amazon shares higher by five-tenths of 1%, of course, as we explore that story. Look, there's a lot to digest today, but, of course, CPI in focus in the next couple of hours. That does it for early edition surveillance is ahead. Tom, John, and Lisa with the eco data that matters. This is Bloomberg.